May we pray. Prepare our hearts, O Lord, to accept your word. Silence in us any voice but your own, that hearing we may also obey your will. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. So last week on the sermon I posted to YouTube, we heard Jesus' instruction to not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, but lay up treasure in heaven, which we took to mean lay up treasure in God himself. Remember, in ancient Jewish practice, it was very common to use surrogate terms for the name of God in order to not take the Lord's name in vain. And this is very common in Matthew, where all the other authors of the Gospels call it the kingdom of God. Matthew calls it the kingdom of heaven. But of course, he means God. And so when I hear Jesus say, lay up treasure in heaven, I take Jesus to mean lay up treasure in God himself. Because where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And to quote a title of an excellent book by James K.A. Smith, you are what you love. And a heart given over to the likes of money and material possessions will be hard-pressed to live a life of loving obedience to God because those two masters, as Jesus calls them, will clash with one another. And no one can serve two masters, Jesus says, for they will either hate the one and love the other, or they'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. So something has to give, in other words. And what that something is is determined by the treasures of our hearts. Well, in our text this morning, Jesus continues to teach about how his disciples are to relate to material possessions. Our text is Matthew chapter 6, beginning in verse 25. Jesus says, Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on, is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his or her life? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. This is the word of the Lord. Is there a dumber, more naive, more ridiculous, more stupid wish in your childhood than I wish I was a grown-up? I mean, I wished for some pretty stupid things as a kid. I wished one day after baseball practice my name was Mark because my baseball coach's name was Mark, and I thought, that's pretty cool. But I don't think there's anything stupider I wished for than to be a grown-up. And all of us adults, there's a reason you laughed and some of the kids didn't, all of us adults at some point realized that we had no idea what we were asking for, you've got it made coming up in school. Now, look, I'm glad I'm an adult. You don't get to be married when you're a child, not in a real way anyway. We're about to be parents after all. Most of you saw that. There's much to be enjoyed about adulthood. But still, think about what you've got going for you coming up through school. You've got a predictable schedule. You've got friends who you know you're going to see every single day. You've got extracurriculars. You've got long holidays. You've got really long holidays when you get to college. Zach got to experience that month-long Christmas break for the first time. And maybe you get a part-time job, but it's only so you can have some fun money. You're good everywhere else. If you're like me, you get your ultimate Frisbee end every weekend. You're able to eat what you want to with little to no consequences. You have high levels of church involvement and participation. Sounds pretty familiar. But then what happens? Then we get what we asked for. 
we grow up. Eight to threes are replaced by nine to fives. Friends are replaced by co-workers. Extracurriculars and holidays are replaced by <laughs> nothing. You just don't have them anymore. And your church commitment takes a big step back. You're tired on Sundays. And your fun money quickly becomes money for rent, the mortgage, student loans, the car payment, insurance, taxes, baby formula. Oh, yeah, and, and maybe groceries and something to wear. And this kind of life, well, sucks the life right out of you. It's easy to become a slave to it. It's easy to see why Jesus says no one can be slave to two masters. Most of your translations will say servant. That's a very censored word. It's slave. Many of Sarah in my evenings have been spent going to work, coming home to work, eating some leftovers on the couch, never at the dinner table. We're too tired for formal dinners. Watching TV, an episode or two or three or five of Grey's Anatomy, before going to bed and repeating the routine the very next day. It often seems like, frankly, there's not much more to life than this. And then we come to church, and we hear Jesus say something like, Do not be anxious about your life, or what you will eat, or what you will drink, nor about your body what you will put on. And we think, if we're honest, that that's just hard to accept as the truth, or at least the truth that I can obey. Now, to say this up front, Jesus is not talking about, in this text, clinical anxiety, or what we would call an anxiety disorder. And this passage and others like it, in my opinion, have too often been used as kind of a fix-it-quick solution to clinical anxiety. And all that does is make people who suffer from anxiety disorders feel even more insecure and uncertain about themselves than they already are without the pastor's help. So we're talking about a much more superficial kind of anxiety or worry, as some translations put it. And that may be the better translation of that word. The kind which, as Jesus suggests, is worrisome about basic material needs, food, drink, clothing, a kind which in our culture is kind of a consumer-driven, a market-driven worry, filled with questions like, have I clocked enough hours? Have I been productive enough? Do I look the part? Am I reaching my calorie deficit? And to all of that, not to anxiety disorders, Jesus says, don't be anxious. But what does he mean, don't be anxious? How can he say that? Well, to begin with, for Jesus, the answer starts with a glimpse out the window. Just look around you. Creation itself, as flawed and as broken and as corruptible as it may be on this side of the eschaton, nevertheless testifies to a God who delights in providing for the works of his hands. Birds are given food and shelter despite the fact that, quote, they never reap nor sow nor gather into barns. In other words, they don't do half the work that you or I do to get food, to put food on the table, as we put it, and yet they fare pretty well. And then Jesus continues, consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. Wildflowers bloom and clothe our landscapes. Lilies, flowering dogwoods, which I looked it up, North Carolina State Flower. Dandelions, blue bonnets, without any toiling or spinning whatsoever, and really without any real use. There's no practical reason for wildflowers to grow. They just live one day and are burned the next, as Jesus puts it, but they grow and they bloom, and we kind of depend on them. I remember growing up in Texas, we look forward to when the blue bonnets grow on the side of the highway every year, unless you've got one of those moms who makes you get out of the car and take pictures on the middle of the interstate. But I digress. But they just do that because God loves beauty. And beauty doesn't need a reason to exist. And he clothes his creation with that beauty for us to enjoy it. Passages like these, by the way, reveal just how much Jesus' imagination was shaped by the Psalms. Because his words here are reminiscent of the great Psalm 104, where there the psalmist praises God, saying, You make springs gush forth in the valleys. They flow between the hills, and they give drink to every beast of the field. The wild donkeys even quench their thirst. 
Beside them the birds of the heavens dwell. They sing among the branches. From your lofty abode you water the mountains. The earth is satisfied with the fruit of your work. Indeed, the very creation of the very existence of creation itself testifies to a God who in his freedom, he had no reason to create anything, but in his freedom and his love, he created so that he could love and provide for and care for something apart from himself. But that's not the thrust of Jesus' teaching. The thrust is greater still. See, his observations about creation are a springboard to a deeper reason for why disciples, you and me, Jesus' followers, are to cease worrying. He says in 6, verse 31 through 32, Therefore do not be anxious, asking, What shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles, which means outsiders of the community of Jesus, seek after these things. And your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. The Creator God, who has filled our world with such wonderful, mysterious, beautiful things, and who is hard at work preserving and renewing those things, is your heavenly Father. He's your Father. Your Father who delights in you so much more than birds and lilies, and who already knows what you need. This is why Jesus can say, do not be anxious. And it should sound familiar, because Jesus' language here is just like it was. We call this an echo, an echo of his language back in chapter 6, verses 7 through 8. Do not heap up, heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do. For they think they will be heard for their many words. Don't be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. We talked about this. The Gentiles had to heap up these empty words and phrases and incantations because they feared that if they didn't, they worried or were anxious that if they didn't, their gods, either with a lowercase g or an uppercase, wouldn't respond, that they'd be unimpressed. And that worry carried over into their daily lives. They lived lives of constant anxiety about material needs because for them, the answers to Jesus' question is not, is not life worth more than food and clothing was no, not really, not at all. See, their gods were disinterested in human life. And they were definitely disinterested in, if you're thinking the Greek gods, sharing the wealth of their Greek gods and goddesses with who? Human beings? Really? They couldn't be counted on for provision because they don't care about your needs. Do you sometimes feel the same? I do. It's too easy, honestly. Too easy to believe that God has nothing to do with my material needs. I may indulge my pastor or my Bible study or my devotional and think that God cares about satisfying my spiritual needs, about forgiving me, maybe, offering me salvation, maybe. But I've got to look after my own physical ones. I've got to put bread on the table, okay? God doesn't have anything to do with that. We live as, as Jesus says, the oligopistoi, those of little faith, whose low view of God produces a life of worry and anxiety. But Jesus won't let us maintain that low view of God. He won't let us have a God that is, as J.B. Phillips puts it in his book, too small. He won't let us lose sight of who God is. He asks, if God so clothes the grass of the field... If he so feeds the birds of the air and nourishes the trees of the forest, will he not much more do so for you? Not much less. Sometimes we think God gives us whatever time he can offer when he's not taking care of the world. Much more. And Jesus' implied answer is, of course he will. Of course he will because he is your father and he knows what you need. So what, am I just supposed to not work? I'm doing my job right now. Am I not depending on the providence and provision of God? 
This is where many of our minds go when we hear these passages, and many people throughout history thought that is exactly what this passage meant. These desert fathers, as we called them, retreated to the wilderness so that they could live a life of total dependence on God's provision. And good for them, <laughs> but that isn't necessary. <laughs> yeah, good for them. Of course we are to work. There's a difference between being carefree about material goods and care less about material goods. And who's to say that these jobs aren't the means through which God provides? Even the birds, Jesus' first example from nature, teach us to balance our understanding of God's provision with our work and with our labors. As the great Protestant reformer Martin Luther famously said of this passage, God provides food for the birds, but he doesn't drop it into their beaks. So Jesus' point is not that working for a living or dressing for the occasion even, business cash, if you will, is unnecessary. It's not it at all. And it certainly isn't that money, food, and water don't matter. Jesus' first miracle had to do with water and wine. But you know, water. Only that disciples are not to be controlled by their need for material possessions. Or thinking back to the passage from last week, it is not to be the treasure of their heart, not to be the light of their eye, not to be the master to whom they give their obedience. Because there is more to life than food and to the body more than clothing. So much more. That's the implied answer to that question. Is there more? Of course there is. There is the kingdom of God. And his righteousness. That is what Jesus says his disciples are to seek above everything else. This passage, Matthew 6, verse 33, is in fact one of, if not the cornerstone of the whole Sermon on the Mount. Because two of the main themes of the sermon converge here. The kingdom of God and his righteousness. The life of obedience and character lived under his rule. And we are to seek it first. Because as we speak... As you and I live and move and have our being, God, by his Holy Spirit, is hard at work establishing his rule and reign right here in Catawba County, right here in Newton and Conover, right here in Trinity Baptist Church. And he's calling his people, he's calling you, and he's calling me to join him and to share in his work, to participate in this work, you get to co-work with God, confident that he, our Father, will provide for us as we go. But if our lives have been reduced to a life of perpetual anxiety over money or food and clothes, it's not just that Jesus considers that sinful, though he very well may, but it's that we will completely miss out on what God is doing because we've already chosen our master and we care not for what he's up to. You'll completely miss it. You'll miss the opportunity to contribute to something far greater than the pagan idol that often is the economy. One day, Jesus and his disciples spent an afternoon ministering to a great crowd and healing their sick. And when it was evening, the disciples came to Jesus and said, Lord, this is a desolate place, and the day is now over. Send the crowds away to go into the village and buy some food for themselves. It's a perfectly reasonable and practical suggestion. They'd been there all day. People were getting hungry. The kids were starting to fuss. The disciples, if you're reading this with a semi amount of objectivity, seem pretty thoughtful here, prudent even. They're just worried that this crowd who's been with them so faithfully, they've been with them all day, was going to go hungry. But Jesus is completely unfazed. It's almost like he doesn't care, He's just casual about it. He says they need not go away. You can almost imagine him kind of shrugging when he said it. You give them something to eat. And then the disciples, in kind of an exercise of common sense, protest, we only have five loaves and two fish. You can kind of visualize them huddling together, being like, I don't know, I hate it when he does this. Okay, well, let's just tell him. Got five loaves. Sure, we'll feed them. Same thing, unfazed. Jesus says, bring them here. 
And you know how the story goes. Jesus took the food, offered a blessing, a word of thanks to his father, our father, and the whole crowd, 5,000 men, not including women and children, ate until they were satisfied, and 12 baskets of leftovers were picked up. The disciples were so caught up worrying about food that they almost not only missed an opportunity, but canceled an opportunity to experience the generosity of God on full display. The disciples wanted to send the crowds away. They were well-meaning, but nevertheless, they wanted to send them away. But Jesus told them, have a seat, Matthew says, on the grass. So they sat down in the grass of the field that God so clothes in beauty. They listened to the evening songs of the birds who God provides for, and they were satisfied, ate to their heart's content by the Heavenly Father who so generously provides for his children who seek him first. Life with God is so much more than food and clothing. Please, don't miss it. 